Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So welcome, as I say, to Martina, to Trevor and the dog here in the room. And also to welcome George, Pat, Emma and Trevor who are on via um, the telephone. Um, we don't have any apologies, so we're expecting Christopher along uh, in a moment. Um, so as ever, we're being recorded and broadcast online at the moment. And just would ask that members, if you have got um, uh, telephones, etc., just to make sure that they're on silent and kept away from the microphones. So uh, just confirming we have no apologies. Yeah. Okay. Folks, the draft minutes are uh, available on page five of the meeting pack. Are members content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings from last week? Oh. Yep. Okay, so there we go. That's those signed and ready. Uh, matters arising, just from my perspective, on page 10 of the meeting pack, there is a response from the Executive Office confirming that David Sterling and Neil Jackson will brief the committee on the 10th of June on the functioning of government bills. So, are members happy to note that? Yep. Are there any other items arising? Okay. Then I will move on then to... Uh, what, what time do we say for the... That should be done now. Because there's nobody else has come on. Anyway, we'll go as far as the point of waiting on them coming in now. So, uh, item four is a departmental oral evidence on Brexit issues. And on page 12 of the meeting pack, you'll find the relevant issues. Just to uh, let members know that today, um, officials have confirmed that the departmental update will be verbal only. There is no uh, written document being provided to us. And also that uh, in our previous... Um, evidence sessions we had prepared quite a lengthy list of questions which are contained in the pack um, and should it maybe would help members in formulating questions to ask off the officials uh, because we haven't received any feedback on those questions yet from the department um, a response to the request for a copy of the briefing from andrew was provided to ministers in advance of the ireland northern ireland specialized committee meeting which took place on the 30th of april has been received uh, we had requested that and we've received that and it's on page three of the tabled pack that you have today. Uh, the department has advised that the information within the briefing contains what could be considered sensitive information which is of relevance to the ongoing UK-EU negotiations on the future relationship and goes beyond what has been disclosed by either the EU or UK and therefore it would not be appropriate for the briefing to share it with the committee at this time. So... Um, on that basis, we don't have the information of the paper that was provided to them before they attended that meeting. So the departmental officials that are going to be joining us is Andrew McCormick, uh, who is the Director General of the International Relations to the Executive Office. Can I just check, Andrew, are you there online at the moment? Yes, please. Oh, you are indeed, excellent. And is Lorraine Linus, Deputy Director of EU Future Relations there? Yes, I'm on the line. And Lindsay Moore, Director of European Division and Head of the Northern Ireland Office in Brussels. Are you there? I am, thanks. Oh, we're definitely as well. I wasn't talking about you. I didn't think any of you were there. So that's great that you are all on board. So look, maybe just to let yourselves know, as ever, that the uh, session has been recorded by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage. So just to update you on that. And maybe as per usual with the format, we could just pass over to yourselves to give us a... Uh, a presentation and then we'll follow up with questions afterwards. Is that okay, Andrew? Absolutely fine. Chair, thanks, okay. thanks for the opportunity to be with you again, uh, even on this, uh, in this format. Uh, you know, we'll we'll do, our do our best to uh, address uh, the uh, questions and issues that are of most interest and, and be as helpful as we can in, in, uh, in talking to you about this. So maybe just recap on a few things that have happened since, both since um, we last uh, talked to you by phone and then also following on from the uh, session that um, the junior ministers had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so a lot of the focus on um, joint committee, specialised committee, how all those things have been, been work, working out. But I think obviously the um, most important recent development is in relation to uh, the um, paper published last week, the command paper, on the 20th of May, setting out the UK government's approach to implementation of the protocol. That's quite an important step forward. Uh, I think everyone is very conscious of the time constraints. Uh, we have a situation where uh, 
London is saying very clearly that they're not going to seek an extension of the transition period, uh, and that, you know, that, that seems to be a firm position. Uh, that means that actually having things in place, uh, having a, a, a state of readiness achieved by the end of the calendar year, um, in, and I think we talked last time about the small number of scenarios that we have to plan for, either uh, a fully-fledged free trade agreement in place alongside the protocol or uh, a, a, a final departure of the UK from the EU in economic terms with no trade deal uh, and, and how that stands with the protocol. So those are, those are still very, very live issues, uh, but the, 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 the key development is looking at how the protocol is implemented. I think uh, easy, easy to support uh, I think from all points of view, uh, and this is something I'm confident will be backed by all ministers in terms of minimising the impact of the protocol, minimising the economic and regulatory burdens on businesses. That, that's very clearly the purpose and nature of the way it's being approached. Uh, so uh, there are a number of areas where that's still subject to agreement um, uh, between the UK and the EU, uh, and certainly Every, every reason for us to be looking to secure uh, maximum flexibility, minimize friction, and achieve as good an outcome as possible. There is an, a major interaction with the, the future relationship negotiations between the UK and the EU, and also the UK's relationships uh, and negotiations for trade deals with the rest of the world. Uh, and so that, that's one set, there's a whole set of negotiation issues still outstanding and still needing to be resolved. Alongside that, there's work to be done in the realm of implementation, uh, in the realm of legislation. Again, happy to come back to that in more detail as we go through this, uh, this session this afternoon. Um, we have then the negotiation rounds. There's a further round. The last round before the um, review point in June is, is next week. There was a round of negotiations uh, Two weeks ago, we finished on the 15th of May, uh, and our, you know, the information is that, is that that round of negotiations covered all 11 of the so-called negotiating chapters, uh, the different dossiers that are being examined, um, and the, 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 the large delegations from both sides were looking at um, areas of convergence and divergence in the respective negotiating positions. So that's all moving on. Um, the le UK legal texts have now been published, and at the moment uh, we and colleagues across departments are looking at that, uh, looking at that text uh, from their respective policy responsibilities. Um, we know that there are um, significant divergences you know, from the, the, st the statements made by the two chief negotiators, uh, David Frost on the UK side and Michel Barnier on the EU side, so that there's divergence on the governance of the whole arrangement. That, that's one, one key difficulty. Uh, the, the question of open and fair competition or level playing field, you know, you uh, choose your term of art as, as you wish, uh, issue of fisheries, and then internal security. So those are, are definitely areas of, of where progress is limited, and that's understandable. There was a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations uh, last week, and we had uh, the four executive office ministers were all um, dialed into that into that conversation with um, Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove, in the chair, uh, other UK government ministers, including the territorial secretaries of state and um, ministers from the Scottish and Welsh governments. So uh, that, it was a the first, that was the first GMCEN since the 28th of January. There has been more frequent ministerial engagement um, between our ministers and um, especially the Paymaster General and Penny Mordaunt. Um, the agenda for last week's meeting focused on the negotiations, so update from David Frost on the negotiations, um, some discussion on preparedness and how we, how we uh, organize across the UK, across the, the four jurisdictions, um, on, on how to ensure um, both governmental readiness and assisting business readiness. Major, major issues in there, of course. Uh, and 
the implementation of the protocol in a way sits within that as a, 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 a task, uh, one of many, one of several big themes in terms of of making arrangements that are going to work. And there was also at the meeting of, of GMCEN last week uh, a brief update on the uh, review of intergovernmental relations, which is uh, outstanding. Uh, looking ahead into June, um, the um, there will be further meetings of the Specialised Committee and the Joint Committee. I think we haven't got timings or, or uh, proposals for those yet, um, but there are uh, there's obviously a range of issues of principle about implementation to be discussed. You know, there, there, some of the points in the UK government paper were, in effect, proposals that need to be considered uh, ultimately in the Joint Committee. Uh, because there is a prerogative of both sides to bring issues forward in terms of in relation to implementation, so that, that's that's a legitimate part of the ongoing discussions. Uh, there's then a need to resolve the four particular decision points that are specified on which the joint committee needs to, to resolve issues in relation to the application of the protocol. Uh, the first of those in Article 5.1.2 of the protocol is in relation to customs, uh, where there are the, the, the point in the protocol in Article 5 is that, is that tariffs are not payable on goods entering Northern Ireland that are, are considered not to be at risk of moving into the EU. Uh, so obviously it's in our economic interest to, to maximize that um, because that delivers uh, the minimum possible friction. Um, but you know the reason it's there is because for some categories of goods, uh, especially where manufacturers in Northern Ireland are uh, taking, adding value to a product and then exporting it, if they're exporting it into the EU, then by definition that's it's not that, that's then the kind of thing that would be at risk of, of um, compromising the single market. So that, therefore, the, the clause is, is a, it's a necessary thing, but there's detail to be worked out and and every reason to look to maximise. Uh, the, um, the exemptions from tariffs, and of course, this is where the, uh, the, the, the core question of the interaction with the wider trade negotiations matters. Because if, if a, a zero tariff, zero quota deal is achieved, then that's, that minimises that problem in the first place, anyway. So that's one big, big topic, uh, and one where obviously it's important that uh, there is good representation of, of the Northern Ireland perspective on that issue. Uh, Ahead of further meetings uh, that need to take place in the months, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. The second of the four topics is in relation to um, fishery and aquaculture products uh, and the scope for landings for product that is landed by fisheries in, in Northern Ireland being exempt from customs. That's again, there's a detail to be worked out. That's, this is Article 5.3 of the protocol. And uh, there's a detail needed on that one. The third area is in relation to agriculture support. Uh, so Article 10 of the protocol says that there's a need for a decision as to the maximum overall annual level of agricultural support that would be exempt from, from state aid controls. So it's, it's a, to put a, a reasonable, uh, again, this is all about ensuring fair treatment um, of the agriculture sector here compared to both the South and, and the wider EU. So, so it's looking for a, 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 something that is uh, fair and reasonable, but there's detail to be worked out. So this is one of the things that wasn't possible to resolve back in the negotiations in October. The fourth one, uh, Article 12, we've talked about before, is really about oversight and governance of how the protocol will be uh, implemented, uh, and the, uh, it gives uh, some uh, access for commission officials to uh, oversee what's going on. So that, 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 that's, uh, that's what is provided for, uh, but it needs to be worked out in detail, and that's, that's very much a matter between London and Brussels. So um, those, those issues are progressing. There's detailed work going on on those. Uh, there's uh, you know, need for us to, to represent uh, properly the Northern Ireland view on those things. Uh, there will be further meetings with the Specialised Committee and Joint Committee soon. How quickly those four issues are resolved is not yet 
totally clear. Um, and there's then, in parallel with that, further round of negotiations next week, uh, with leading to a high-level stocktake meeting later in June, where there will be an assessment of progress and a decision taken as to what's going what's going on. And that's how to how to go forward, how to structure further steps, or you know, in extremis, the, 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 the things could could um, be, a, be a, there could be a problem at that, at that stage, but. Uh, I think the expectation is there will be a further further work and further detailed negotiations, um, and that's all where it's going. There's quite a few areas where I know you've you've sought further information, and some of those will come through. Uh, uh, Lorraine and Angel will keep me right as, as to exactly where different things stand, uh, and, and we, we shouldn't. If, if an answer to some of your written questions are about to come, then we'll, we'll uh, not I think we prudent not to. Preempt the written answers in, in discussion this afternoon, but we'll, we'll try to be as helpful as we can. Uh, and uh, taking taking your, your questions and comments on um, both what I've said by way of introduction and the um, other areas where I know you and um, uh, our members have um, keen interest in, in what's going on. So I hope that's of some help to setting the scene, Chair. Thank um, you, Andrew, for that. I will uh, start off. I suppose uh, I want to precursor this remark by saying I appreciate and understand that it's not your fault. Um, but generally, from an update, uh, it's hoped that one will have new information or would get an update on existing information. And I have to say that having listened to the presentation thus far, I don't feel like I've heard anything new. I don't feel that there's any update, anything extra. Um, and again, whilst this is certainly not your uh, fault or issue, um, I do think it's important that uh, we communicate with the department again to say that the purpose of a scrutiny is to give us something to scrutinise. Um, and you know, it, it concerns me that effectively a cliff edge in terms of the whole process of Brexit is looming um, in a month that starts on Monday. And we still have structures within the um, architecture of the negotiations that haven't even met. Um, and that is something that, that causes concern because uh, the purpose of, of various groups within the um, architecture, um, and I'm talking, for example, about the Joint Consultative Working Group, the purpose of it is to actually scope out from um, sectors what their thoughts and what their views and what their expectations and what their hopes are. And if it hasn't met, then those views and thoughts can't be put um, as part of negotiations to then decide during June at that stock taking exercise, are we at the point um, that we can actually have some form of meaningful process that will conclude then at the end of the 31st of, of December for people going forward. To move maybe to some specific questions, um, we had asked at a time of day that, you know, that with JMC uh, meetings taking place, that the committee would get advance notice of agendas uh, and the issues that ministers plan to raise. Um, is that something that the department can't provide us with? Um, part of what happened uh, last week was that uh, the arrangements were, were pretty fluid and not confirmed until quite a short time before the meeting actually happened. So I think uh, there's probably just a little bit of the hangover of just the current um, you know, limitations on, on working arrangements. Now, uh, that, that's, I'm only, only, only saying that by way of context. Uh, I'm not sure if there's, a, if there's any more we can say about that. I think there is, there is probably better practice elsewhere in some of the other jurisdictions in terms of, of providing advance notice. Uh, and it's something we, we need to, to see what's possible uh, looking ahead. But Lorraine may have, may have more to add on that. Uh, yes, I could just say that previously, uh, JMC EN would have had a schedule of meetings and we roughly knew when they were going to happen and we had a bit more certainty around them. There had been a lot of uncertainty from the last meeting on the 28th. This one was put in the diary quickly. It was done um, 
on, you know, uh, virtually, which also meant that even up until 24 hours before, we weren't sure if everybody could attend. But we'd be happy to work with the committee on how you would like to be informed of, of meetings as we move forward and the best way of doing that. Uh, I think when, they, you know, when, when people travel to them, there needed to be certainty about the meeting a little bit more in advance. You doing them uh, in this virtual format makes them a lot more agile, but happy to take your suggestions on how you would like to be informed on that. The agenda is by ministers, and it was literally approved within 24 hours of, of the meeting as well. Um, so it's just how to work with you. Thank you for that. Um, preparedness. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's possible to, to get better sound, please. Sorry. I, I wasn't speaking at that stage, so maybe I'm hoping that's what it was. Can you hear me okay now? You're still quite faint, I'm afraid. But, but can be heard or just faint? Yes, I can, I can, I can but just about. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to speak as, as loudly as I can. You're okay, that's fine. Um, I'm saying that preparedness for the end of the transition period was discussed at the meeting. So what stage is the executive at in terms of preparations for a no deal? So uh, there's further work needed uh, and, and it needs to be brought forward for detailed discussion. But it, it was discussed, as you say, at, at, at uh, the JMCEN meeting. Um, there's a, a recognition that, that the... Um, quite detailed work that has begun in Whitehall within within the UK government system needs to be extended to be more inclusive of ourselves and the other two devolved administrations. Uh, there are there's a whole, whole range of projects and uh, work streams going on. Uh, we need to get more deeply involved in that. Uh, we all, always need to be saying at every stage to London and Edinburgh and Cardiff, you know, that our position will be different because the protocol will be there. So, so th th that always means that things they might assume uh, and even plan for that are reasonable in their own terms might have a twist uh, or an angle that is different for us. And, and we, so we really, really need to be uh, on top of this game. Uh, it's it's uh, now, I think, increasingly a top priority. Uh, I would emphasize that, that there's a need for, for preparedness to be effective whatever happens. Uh, so the, the range, uh, back to the, the scenarios we talked about last time, there's um, um, the issue of uh, what happens if there's no negotiated outcome, no trade deal. Um, that would have one set of assumptions would apply in that context. Uh, you'd be making assumptions about how goods would flow, for example. The, 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 the crucial one that will affect everything um, is the way in which goods move to and from uh, you know, across the short straits between um, England and France and, 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 the, and the Low Countries. And that, that's, that's the uh, fundamental supply line for everything. And, and if there's disruption on that route, or on, on, sorry, on that large group of routes, then that affects everything. Uh, so that, there's, there's a whole set of planning assumptions in there that need to be worked out to allow for, well, what, what what would happen? What, what's a reasonable assumption about how good, how, how lorries will move back and forwards in both directions there? So that, that, that's as big a determining factor as any, any in all of this. And we need to, to, to be looking at that, uh, working it all through. Um, but that, that's in what's called a non-negotiated outcome, uh, um, where the, 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 there's nothing over and above the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol. If there's a, a, a free trade agreement, um, there would still be a whole range of things for us to prepare for. Uh, the quality or, or the existence or non-existence of a free trade deal doesn't make an awful lot of difference to what we required, for example, on the SPS side in relation to um, um, Northern Ireland, uh, because that, that's a separate part of the protocol. It, 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 it stands... It stands anyway and would need to be addressed so there's a whole lot of preparation to be done on that whatever the scenario uh, so preparedness is not just preparing for no deal it's preparing for any outcome uh, there's a lot of work to be done uh, anyway 
the, the vital thing, uh, and I think FM said this quite strongly in one of the interviews, was just that the, the thing we need most is clarity for business, uh, clarity as to what, what regulatory regime they'll have to comply with, uh, how that's going to work, um, what's that going to mean in terms of VAT, in terms of, of uh, the operational side of all of that, uh, especially for the agri-food sector. That, that's going to be uh, a piece of work that needs done. Whatever happens, it's, it's, it's not, not, it's not, um, we're not talking about something that's only a contingency planning process as, as we were doing last year for the risk of no deal. There'll be an outcome. Uh, either way, lots of things will change. Either way, uh, businesses need clarity. So on a glass half full basis, last week's protocol paper was a very, very important step towards that clarity. It doesn't give in sufficient detail. There's some things, a lot of things still to be resolved, but a very, very important step in the direction towards clarity, resolution, uh, a place where you can actually say to businesses, you know, here is a checklist of things that will apply. Here are all the things that, that will change how, how the position on 1st of January 2021 will be different from 31st of December 2020 and, and help them uh, both in, in guidance uh, to, to be ready. In some cases, that, you know, they will take their own business decisions. So there will be a whole range of things where, where you know, future planning and investment will depend on their assessment of what this would mean, uh, which is why it's so vital to get to a stage where we're, we're uh, both communicating clearly and minimizing the frictions because you know, the, the, uh, that, that's why... The, some of the outstanding issues that need to be negotiated are incredibly urgent now uh, to, to, to make progress so that we get to a place as soon as is conceivable, conceivably possible where the message to businesses is now it's clear, you, you know, here's what's going to apply and, and here's how it's all going to work. That, that's, uh, that, that's the goal we have to get to, whether that's an, a, a very extensive free trade agreement plus the protocol, or just the protocol. Um, just to interrogate you a little further there, um, Andrew, you said that in, you know, preparations were underway within Whitehall and that really we would need to be getting involved with them. Is that not something that Whitehall has been reaching out to the devolved administrations to say there's a chance that this could be a no deal and here's the preparations that we have to make? Is that just something that we might need to get involved in, given that we're one month away from potentially that decision and seven months away from the implementation of that? So they're, they're, yes, they're, they're... The invitation is there from, from Whitehall to, to get involved. Uh, that's, that is happening. Again, the, the factual reality is that a lot of the people who were involved in uh, the, trans the planning for transition and implementation of the withdrawal agreement were diverted onto COVID. And quite, quite a few people are still diverted onto COVID, and that's just, just a, a, a factual reality. It, it's getting better as, as, the, as we're moving into a, a, a bit more of a, a plateau on the COVID side. So that, that, but that's the, the, uh, I think it's totally understandable that the, the focus of attention on people whose job it is to do operational planning was on very short term, very, very critical operational planning over the last um, 10 weeks or so, it, it's in the last, I think, what, 10 days or so that we've begun to see them uh, opening us up. And, uh, and in, in, in good faith, that's what they're doing. There's no criticism. It's just, just uh, I, I do share your concern that time is very, very short and we need to get into this urgently. But, uh, you know, th th there is also you know, a very big difficulty, obviously, in, in, in the form of COVID. Is it your assessment, Andrew, that the, with as a result of coronavirus, which is nobody's fault, if we uh, can put it in that term, but as a result of coronavirus, that the department isn't prepared to implement a no deal scenario? Um, we're undeniably less attention and less preparation has been done than uh, had the um, had the virus not come along. There's, there's no that's just uh, obvious fact. Um, but there is significant time still available to, to uh, clarify. I think that uh, very, very important 
to get that initial statement of clarity on the intended approach to implementing the protocol. That, that was probably our biggest, uh, our biggest single concern up to last week, and so again, very, very important that that's happened. Um, there's a lot more detail required. There's no, no denying that, but very, very important step in the right direction. There was a document called the uh, UK's approach to the protocol, um, and the executive had given considerable um, input to that. Is 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 that input available for us to scrutinise? Um, I'm not sure. I don't recognise the word considerable in that context. Um, what the, the 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 document? I think it's paragraph seven of the document uh, acknowledged uh, helpful input from um, ministers, from the MPs, um, and the business community, and. Certainly, there have been significant representations have been made, including correspondence from ministers uh, pressing the point in relation to, for example, unfettered access. So there certainly have been representations made, but uh, you know, th 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 it's not that um, there was extensive um, you know, policy debate uh, where um, the UK shared possible proposals and got reactions from ministers that 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 didn't happen and and no one's claiming it happened uh you know there they, they were there were important representations made i think we talked before about the, the, the executive's determination to represent its position with strength so that they, yes there were some proposals um i think in particular uh, in relation to unfettered access from ministers in relation to quite a few aspects of the protocol from the business community who've done exceptionally good work uh, they've given some feedback, but it's 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 been quite limited, uh, and I think there's a now I think a significant opportunity to move on. You know. Well, that was my my apologies. Change gear and, and make this a much more um, substantive engagement. As I said, I, I was apologising. It was my use of the word considerable, just given that we're facing one of the biggest constitutional, cultural, and trading arrangements to the island of Ireland in a generation, I would have thought that the request from elected representatives would have been considerable, but it's, I suppose, maybe somewhat disappointing to hear if it wasn't. My final question then would be, has there been any discussion within the executive office and any uh, situation progressed to take in a view on asking for a delay to the implementation of Brexit, given what you've already mentioned to us in terms of the focus hasn't been on Brexit given the coronavirus? Has there been any discussion within the department to reach a, an opinion on that? Uh, there's discussion and there are opinions, but there's no, there's no formal position on that. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm going to pass now to Doug as the Deputy Chair of the Committee. Um, Good uh, Andrew, uh, Lorraine and Lindsay, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, Andrew, thank you for uh, your presentation. Without a shadow of a doubt, there are many strands to go through in regards to this and uh, disentangling ourselves from the EU and also putting in um, structures to, to make life work between us all. To, to, you know, um, and, and, and I thank you for the considerable work that you are all doing in, in regards to that. I, I guess I've only got two questions. One is very pointed uh, and the other one is, is maybe just a general sense of things. Um, but given the fact is that whether there's agreement or whether there's no agreement, um, can I just confirm that the Northern Isles Civil Service are planning solely on the principle of unfettered access to the GB market and that there's no other planning considerations, there's no other courses of action, whether there's a deal, whether there's agreement or no agreement? So, um, we, we are, we are we're looking at a range, the, the two scenarios are, are in the total picture, the total picture of, of how things will apply at the end of the year amount to uh, two broad scenarios, and there might be a bit of light and shade, a bit of grey between the two, but the two extremes are either um, a non-negotiated outcome, in which case the protocol applies, and there's nothing but there's only the withdrawal agreement, uh, which covers citizens' rights, financial contribution, the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol, uh, and the other scenario is, is a free trade deal. Uh, you know, the best case would be if the UK has secured everything stated in its 
um, mandate document or approach document that was published in February as to, as to how, uh, what it's looking for in the negotiation. So unfettered access applies in both of those scenarios because it's, it's, it's a dimension of the protocol. Uh, it's a um, manifestation of the very clear agreement in October that um, Northern Ireland uh, remains part of the, uh, the UK customs territory, uh, remains a part of the UK internal market, and that uh, um, the, the UK government promised a new, a new decade, new approach to legislate, to guarantee unfettered access. Now, again, that's, that promise was repeated in last week's document. Uh, it, there's clearly a need to move move on from promise into into uh, detailed implementation. What, what will that legislation do? How, how will that interact with the uh, regulatory discretion that does exist for uh, the devolved administration? So it's not not purely a matter for London. Edinburgh and Cardiff have an interest in that as well. But the principle is there. The promise of unfettered access applies. So, so yes, yes, we're absolutely, we're planning on that basis. Uh, there, are, there are still wrinkles even in that. Uh, again, the um, UK had to acknowledge back last October that uh, there was one constraint on unfettered access, which was the um, international obligation in relation to exit declarations. So that, that came out in, in Parliament uh, in October last. But last week's document says that, that uh, the UK sees no reason for those to be that, for that that procedure to be required, given that goods are moving from one part of the UK to another. So that, that's their position on that, that there's no need for those declarations, which would be the only actual bureaucratic manifestation that would oppose unfettered access. Uh, so, so it is a central uh, planning assumption. It's a, it needs to be delivered. Uh, it's, it's been promised, but again, getting into detail is important on that. Uh, in terms of, of, of where our attention and energy has to go. Uh, I'm not sure there's much more we can do about that one other than keep pressing the UK government to, to, to be specific about what it's saying and what it means and, and how this is made effective. Um, but um, the, there are, there's more to be done, more detail, more, more complexity uh, in relation to the movement of goods in the other direction, as in from GB to NI, where you know the protocol has some... There, there are, Definitely some big, big challenges in there that need to be addressed. I'm, 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 have I picked up your question correctly there? Uh, Andrew, you, 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 have, you absolutely have. Um, uh, and I guess you know what, what you said is really important to business because business needs to know um, in uns no uncertain terms whether there's an agreement or no agreement that there will be that unfettered access. And I think you've laid that out um, pretty well. And, and you've, you've sort of drifted into uh, my second, more general question. Uh, and, and I know there's more grey areas uh, about... Uh, goods coming from uh, GB to Northern Ireland. So I was just going to ask if you could give us a sense uh, of the points of access to the goods that are coming from GB to Northern Ireland. I know Michael Gove said there'll be no new customs infrastructure. Can you just give us a sense of what we're going to be talking about here, what we're going to be looking at um, you know, uh, in regards to the checking of goods that are coming from GB and into Northern Ireland? So uh, the I think that's important to, to separate two, two distinct dimensions of that, and that's the issue of customs uh, and tariffs, which would apply to uh, the, all, ca all categories of goods, and then the specific provisions that apply to uh, agri-food, products of animal origin, everything that's subject to the SPS regime. Uh, so on the first of those, uh, the relevant bits of the protocol are first few paragraphs of Article 5, and the, the key concept is that uh, where, and this is emphasized very strongly in the UK government last, uh, document last week, where um, goods are uh, coming from GB and, st and staying in Northern Ireland, uh, you know, for example, uh, going straight onto supermarket shelves or whatever, uh, straight into, re into retail, um, then um, there is there's no issue there for Europe to worry about. There's no risk to the single market. I mean, what, what, what would be concerning, what is, I think what, what is a legitimate concern and the reason that that clause is in the protocol from a European point of view is that if, um, if the 
door between GB and NI is wide open, uh, and the and the land border is is totally open, and there's no no uh, checks or controls there at all. Then what's to stop people exploiting that and diverting flows of goods such, in such a way that would undermine uh, the integrity of the single market? That, that's that's the origin of the concern, and I mean, the first point I think to make on that is is um, this is the benefit of being relatively small. In, in global economic terms, the scale of, of, of the issue is not that, that big. And if you then look at the fact that a very large proportion of the goods that come in to Belfast Port, Lawrence, and whatever are sold, consumed uh, you know, within, within the region, uh, then that, that minimizes the risk. So I think every effort needs to be put into uh, demonstrating the, the way in which the market works and ensuring, therefore, that, that uh, there is a, a minimal application of that, that issue, that the, the, issue, the so-called at-risk goods category is, is kept to a, a negotiable minimum. Um, and and that's, that's the objective. Uh, the provision is that, again, if, there's a, if, there, are, if there's a tariff differential, uh, then um, the uh, Article 5.1 of the protocol would create an obligation for EU tariffs to apply where there's a risk of, of the goods going into the EU through Northern Ireland. Um, so that, that's, that's why the negotiations on tariffs in, 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 will matter so much in the, in the mainstream trade negotiations and why, if we end up with a non-negotiated outcome, uh, in which case uh, then the normal um, MFN tariffs or most favoured nation tariffs would apply in both directions, then you start to have more of an issue, which is why, from a regional point of view, from a protocol point of view, getting a good deal in the main negotiations is a, is a highly desirable outcome. So that, that's the first category. In that it's about customs, and it's about tariffs, and it's about the totality of, of uh, all, all goods. And uh, as you said, the UK has stated that, that it sees uh, it, it can fulfill, fulfill its obligations on information flows uh, through without customs infrastructure. Uh, I think the, the underlying point remains that, that customs information will be required. You, you have to there, there's a there'll be an obligation to provide information, but if that can be provided solely by digital means, then that's a very very positive uh, thing to look for, uh, either immediately or, or as soon as possible. So that that's uh, that's the first category. On SPS, uh, the considerations are a, a bit different. Um, because the, the issue there is not about uh, tariffs or customs, but about the reason the SPS um, controls exist is to protect uh, human health, animal health, plant health, to respect, as the, as the UK said in, its paper, in the paper last week, uh, to respect the very long-standing integrity of the island as a single epidemiological unit. Uh, that, 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 I think they, they, they cited that going back, uh, you know, uh, to the 19th, 19th century, uh, and there are, there are some uh, controls uh, that, that exist that have, have always been in place uh, for that basis and that reason. You know, when we used to fly on airplanes, I remember those days, uh, you know, the, the announcement would, would come, if you've been on a farm in, in Great Britain, please report to the Department of Agriculture import inspector. So that there, there, there are that, that regime is familiar. It will need to be expanded quite materially. Uh, because of EU exit to ensure that, that, it, that there's a proper protection of the SPS regime. But it's still a matter of, of, of managing, uh, managing that sensibly and, and, uh, with, and the clear objective, as the UK paper says, and as everyone, everyone else would say, to minimize the, the, the impact of those controls. The controls need to be there. They need to be effective. They need to work. And... Uh, you know, there's no, no doubt or debate about the, the uh, need for, for controls. The question is, can they be minimized and made as, as low-key as possible? And always, in, in every situation, on every, every other external boundary of the EU, uh, you know, a, a consideration as to how the checks are applied would be both looking at um, circumstantial risk, you know, what, what's, what's the actual threat. If there's no actual threat, then the degree of checking can be much lower than if, if 
there's a concern that a neighbouring country, for example, has you know lax controls on some area of risk that might lead to a disease entering the EU and spreading, and and so the, you know everyone would want that uh, to be prevented. That's vital for for our um, agriculture sector to have the, the, the excellent reputation it has in terms of plant health and animal health. I mean that, that's that's a, a part of the. Um, our, our marketing strength depends on that high quality reputation that the excellent work on food security that is done in Northern Ireland. So every reason to want to protect our economic interests in those terms and, and therefore to be secure. But if the risk is low, then the, the level of checking can be low. So that there's stuff there that needs to be negotiated as to exactly how it applies. Uh, you know, there are, there are different trade deals that involve different degrees different percentages of, of, of physical checking. Uh, there are doc documentary checks are needed, doc documentary evidence is needed uh, so that people know what's coming in. Um, but uh, the actual risk in terms of, um, you know, stuff that is going on to the supermarket shelf will be processed and will be fundamentally safe. So, that, that, so even though it's agri-food products and maybe products of animal origin, the degree of risk may be very, very low for a whole lot, whole lot of products and, and the controls should be totally proportionate to that. Uh, there are then quite specific requirements in relation to live animals, and that is a, a matter of fact part of how the status quo works. So there are, there are controls in the present day on live animals entering Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the, there'll be a need to align those precisely with the new regulatory regime, but but you know that's that's not a big change in the real world. So so this is all. Uh, again, matters of, of working out the practical realities uh, with the clear objective of making sure that the flow of goods is as, as smooth and, and uh, frictionless as possible, uh, that the checks are only what is absolutely necessary. Uh, and, and of course, there's a degree of, of which that is, uh, is depends on uh, what the EU is prepared to accept, and because you know they will they will. Uh, only accept something that, that provides them the level of confidence and security that, that they need. So that there's, there's stuff to be negotiated, but every reason to believe it can be, um, you know, practical and sensible. And recognising, uh, you know, if, if it's risk-based, then lots of things will be actually in the, in the real world very low risk, and therefore should be, should be quite low-key in, in terms of checks. So of course that's a very long answer, but I hope it's of. of um, some help and, and happy to go further on any particular points. Uh, Andrew, it, it, it does. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was a very detailed answer, and thank you for, for that detailed answer. And I, I don't have another question, but I, I guess uh, what I would say to you is uh, there are some slightly conflicting um, views on this. I think two weeks ago, um, the, the information we got from the junior ministers would have said something slightly different, where the, there was a sense that uh, we were all being told that there would be new customs posts being set up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's the sense we got two weeks ago. You've just painted something very, very different to us. Uh, I, think the, 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 I don't think there's actually a, a tension there because um, what, the, what is needed to, to make the, the SPS checks effective are what are called border control posts. Okay, the word, word isn't appropriate for our context because it isn't a border, but the, the, uh, the, the functionality is still needed and, and there is an obligation under the SPS parts of the protocol to uh, make sure that there, the, um, that there are appropriate control posts dealing with uh, the entry of agri-food products, everything that's subject to SPS checks. So I think that's what uh, that's, my, that's what, what Minister Kearney was talking about, and it's also what I'm talking about. There's no, no inconsistency whatsoever. Uh, what is new in the UK paper last week is the commitment to avoid customs infrastructure. Now that that again is is there is a UK proposal. Highly, highly desirable from our point of view, but you know, that, that's why I make the distinction between customs, which has one set of, of constraints and regulations, and SPS. Uh, so, so I think I think I don't think there's a there's a, a difference there at all. No, Andrew, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't think I don't think I was saying that there was a friction or a difference between you. So, and if I, if you think that's what I was trying to imply, it, it wasn't. I, I think it, it, there could have been a terminology issue. You know, we, we, one we're talking about points of access, and the other we're talking about customs points. Um, and in regards to customs, there, there won't be any new infrastructure. But listen, you've been very you've been very patient with me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
going to move on to some other members now, but um, just to conscious that it's taken us nearly 55 minutes just to get the um, chair and deputies, chairs, questions, but Andrew, if I could ask for your support in keeping the answers as concise as possible, it would be really appreciated. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Martina? Okay. Uh, as someone who once described herself as being Brexhausted, um, I don't think brevity and Brexit goes into the, uh, <laughs> the same sentence. Um, I want to say, um, since you were last here on the 29th of April, uh, we did receive the technical note, the EU technical note, the next day. We then, on the 13th of May, as been said, the two junior ministers came here. I was very clear on what Declan Kearney had said about the border control post yeah. being needed for SPS. And I can see in the paper uh, from the British government, they want to avoid the custom um, infrastructure. I think the, the paper that was released by the British government, I think it was nearly uh, a rally to the flag. It's very, um, it's very high, heavy on rhetoric and, and light on fundamental detail, quite aspirational in some respects, given that you're dealing with an international agreement that has been signed off on and we know the implications of that. I obviously, and, and Sinn Féin would obviously have a few uh, that we do not share with this free trade agreements that the British government want to take forward and present it as something that would be advantageous uh, to the people here in the sectors uh, in the north, given that um, goods will no longer have to comply. That would be, for instance, coming in under those free trade agreements with the safety standards of, uh, of the EU, whether it's environment, employment uh, and consumer protection. So I just want that on the, on the record. I think reading the paper, there was a light bulb moment um, in relation to the repercussions of Brexit starting to, uh, be, to be unfortunately accepted when it is too late. Uh, the burden on business around declaration, uh, you can see that in the paper, and the significant extra cost that it will have on business just as side. Where I was at a meeting this morning, an infrastructure meeting in the haulage sector, who um, the sector itself is struggling big time uh, because of COVID-19 and cannot cope with the prospects of what's coming at them in seven months' time, whether there is a deal or no deal, the fact that there's a lack of preparation uh, in place, and they have been quite clearly calling for an extension of the transition period. And we've heard from Michelle Barney today to say that the EU is willing to, uh, to look at a two to three year transition period. And I think in the context of COVID-19 and where the business community is at, that, um, that there's lots of support uh, starting to emerge and that call for the extension. So um, obviously because of the discharge of the protocol, um, in the context of perhaps um, avoiding custom infrastructure, which is fine, um, how uh, in the context of the expansion, if, that is, if there's not going to be an extension, then I see in the paper we're, he, we're seeing things that I thought had been put to bed, I thought had been gone into the bin around technical solutions. You know, let's hope some can be found, but we know they don't exist uh, currently, but they're starting to re-emerge again. So um, I'm wondering that uh, the EU says that putting the necessary infrastructure in place, whether it's new or an extent, extension of what is already there, that that needs to start immediately. So whether it is the border control posts for SPS, that, that that work needs to be done. So I'm wondering where are we with that work? I'm also conscious that the technical note that came out on the 30th of April, they outlined a number of issues that needed to be dealt with. And one was that IT support, um, that there needed to be an IT system put in place so that the system here in the north could plug into the EU system. I'm not sure I understand. 
there you are. There's my 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 watch saying doesn't understand me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the technical note it probably doesn't understand the British government's technical note mm -hmm. um, either. But anyway, the technical note said it it needed to be in place by the first of June. Now that's Monday. First of June's Monday, and I'm wondering uh, where we are at. Uh, with regards to the technical note, it also talked about the dedicated me mechanism needing to be put in place to protect the Good Friday Agreement rights in the six EU equality directives that is outlined in the protocol. Um, if I could get a sense where that's at. And obviously the more of these procedures that can be correctly dealt with through um, the supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, I think was one of the MPs described as technical arrangements that would be put in place, call it what you want, he says. But, um, you know, there, there are none, as we know. So I'm very concerned about the burden that's going to be placed on business, given that they're looking at the clock ticking seven months away. And whether there is a deal or no deal at the end of this, which I hope there is a deal, but even if there's no deal, there are things that need to be put in place for businesses around custom declarations and other matters that they need to start to see and happening so that they can start to plan and prepare. And there, there's, there's no evidence that that has taken place. So they are extremely apoplexic. I'm sure you're being lobbied as we all are being lobbied uh, because businesses know the consequences of what Brexiteers have done to them uh, with regards to the implication of this, um, br this Brexit mess. And therefore, if there's not going to be an extension to the transitional period, then businesses are extremely worried about what is coming at them. So it's just to get a sense from you what's happening now to prepare for what we know needs to happen in the implementation of the protocol. Um, so, yes, briefly to recap on what I said earlier, the, 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 the work on preparedness is uh, now coming into focus as an urgent and top priority. It needs to be considered more, in more detail at the ex executive level. Uh, we need much better access to uh, the work streams and projects that are already underway um, in, in Whitehall. Uh, and that, that was, was discussed and some things were promised at JMCEN last week. Uh, the issues around uh, information systems, uh, you're absolutely right. There's an urgency about getting those into place, getting those, those in, into a, a, a fit for purpose state. Uh, and uh, so take all those points as, as ex extremely serious parts of how this moves forward and why we, why we need to um, mobilize and energize the work within implementing the aspects on SPS, uh, including the effectiveness of the um, control posts that are needed in relation to access for goods, making sure that's, that's done in the right and appropriate way, uh, that the, the, the aspects of customs and tariffs and all are matters for HMRC, uh, not for the devolved administration, although part of our role and part of the, the clear view from our, from ministers is is to get as soon as possible to as clear and straightforward a way of handling it as as is possible. So uh, there's, uh, I think, every reason to share your concerns, but also then it's a matter of making sure that that the work is is mobilised and organised. Will the work be underway for the database system on Monday? Will we start seeing at least the work um, starting um, on that? Because I'm that's the deadline that was given in the technical note by the EU. I'm trying to find the reference in the technical note on, 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 on my computer here as, as we talk. I don't see that particular one. Let, let me check that point out and come back to you. Um, if we could, Chair, through, through, through Chair Martina. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trevor Lung. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Hello, Andrew. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. And just a couple of quick ones here. I'm a bit confused about, once again, about the fisheries just, um, situation. When I look at the technical note, there's a lot of talk about UK or third country fishing vessels, uh, Northern Ireland and UK vessels appear to be third country vessels for the purpose of the protocol. And then um, when I look at the respective um, positions of the UK and Europe, a different document that we have. There's, there's such a clear difference there that you'd wonder how the bridge could ever be 
could ever be crossed. Uh, it seems to me in simple terms that the, the EU wants to have uh, minimal change, let's put it that way, minimal change to the current access arrangements for European fishery boats. And the, uh, the British government wants to have minimal access for EU fishery boats from the end of the transition period. So can you shed any light on this? Is, is there any progress being made? Um, so I think there's a, a genuine difficulty at the, at the highest level in the negotiations on um, you know, the, the fisheries is one, one of the big sticking points in the main negotiations uh, where it's as you've laid out in terms of very, very contradictory positions between uh, the EU wanting a lot of continuity from the status quo and the UK talking strongly about uh, the, the importance of respecting uh, its new, indep new independence. So that, that's the, there's, there's that, that macro level bit of the negotiations, and it's a, a major, major element in there. Um, again, within the different approaches being taken by the EU and, and the UK, there, there may be scope for a, a, a fisheries agreement. Again, if things were going better, then you'd be looking at a fisheries agreement alongside a main, mainstream trade agreement. Then, on top of that, we have the unique aspect, which is in the protocol. This is Article 5.3 of the protocol, which recognises that uh, there are um, need, uh, the need to address how certain fishery and aquaculture products, which are brought, uh, landed, which are landed in Northern Ireland by UK vessels, and, and how that's how that's looked at and how that's treated in terms of, of customs. And that, so that's a very, a very specific area where obviously what um, we, we would want from our point of view would be to, to maximize the exemption. There's a reference to a, a possibility of exemption. And uh, you know, that, that's where um, it's, it's one of the four decisions that is, lies ahead for the, the joint committee to be resolved uh, as something that wasn't settled in October. So th th there's at least those two layers are, are, are um, both in their own right quite complicated. When you bring the two of them together, you get a, a, a quite a, a, co a complex combination of issues there. That all needs, that needs untangled, but I think the, uh, the, the negotiation process will move those on because the, it's, uh, fisheries at large is a, a big and current topic. and the specific Article 5.3 issue in the protocol is one that, again, where, where there's work being done primarily between DERA uh, and, and DEFRA in London. So uh, um, maybe that's a long way of saying that I, I, I share your sense of how complicated this is. Yeah. Uh, well, I know I'm mixing up the, the macro and the micro here, but thanks for what you said. Uh, there is a line in the current positions that states unequivocally that the, as far as Europe is concerned, there'll be no free trade agreement without fisheries agreement. Just one line, and it just sums it all up. And we're, you know, um, we're getting close to the wire. There's, there's, there's still negotiation, and uh, until things move on, you, you know, you never know where things will land. Ah, fair enough. The, just one more then. I, I read the technical note from the 30th of April on implementation. Yeah. Um, there, there's a, a theme running through it on several of the sections, quite a number of the sections, where it says the Commission urges the UK to enter into technical implementation discussions immediately. Now, that was the 30th of April. That, that applies under the rights, single market, state aid, next steps, and I think possibly a couple more. Uh, what, what has been the level of activity between the 30th of April and today, which would give us hope that things are actually happening? So, can't, can't, can't claim to be fully cited on that, and I wouldn't expect to be fully cited because a lot of the aspects of the work at a technical level are in fields that are not devolved and where um, it'd be, there are matters for um, either HMRC, the Treasury in London, or other, other parts of the UK machines. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I can infer that there's a fair bit of discussion going on but I'm, I'm not, we're, we're not, we're not cited and wouldn't expect to be cited on that. The, the area where we're, we're most directly involved would be in the realm of the SPS controls, because that's where 
a lot of the responsibilities fall to 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 Dara. Um, so um, the, the um, I think there's a there is a uh, a need a need to, to to push that further, and certainly we we, we have a responsibility to represent the interests of, of the business community um, in Northern Ireland, and that, that's certainly part of what we're seeking to do. You know, so it, it's I guess, sorry, that's not not much of an answer to be honest, Trevor, but, but it's I think uh, it's certainly every reason for us to keep pushing these things. You know. Yeah, um, and and that's my last one, and and, and the area. Of of these sort of macro discussions where they would they would affect the situation of Northern Ireland. Are we involved at all? Do we have access? Do we have uh, even non speaking rights in those discussions? I mean what's what's the level of input? Well, across the formal level, yes. Um, uh, there, you know, there are there are speaking rights at a joint committee, at specialised committee. Those are, are um, absolutely clear and, and I know so the, so the ministers Kearney and Land were invited and, and had the opportunity to contribute at the joint committee on the 30th of March, and I had my full opportunity as well at the specialised committee. So those, those are, are genuine opportunities. Uh, the, I think the point is that neither of those meetings were yet at the level of of substance where it was necessary to represent a view because there, there was no actual proposal for resolution on the table. And that's that's coming, you know. In terms of the uh, uh, the, the mainstream negotiations, we're, we're in a much more limited uh, context, you know, yeah. where uh, you know we have some briefing and debriefing on what's going on, but not uh, actually any direct access to the mainstream negotiations. Okay, thank Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, Christopher. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, go ahead, yes. Yes, that's grand. Um, in terms of paragraph 30 of the government's document, the, the UK government's document that was published, it says the rules are administered by UK authorities who retain operational responsibility, able to exercise discretion, including with regard to the risk assessment of goods. should be noted, for example, the UK currently checks only 4% of third country movements notified through customs declarations with under 1% of physical fiscal checks of the consignments, and clearly goods from the rest of the UK will not present a similar level of risk to third country movements. So if you're talking the stuff going from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, you're talking less than 1% being checked, is that right? Um, that's what that appears to say, yes. Okay, so in terms of uh, SPS. I am obviously I've never served on the DERA committee. I don't represent a rural constituency. I think we've got one farmer in South Belfast. But um, in terms of the percentage of live, are all live animal movements? This is, this is all, the, the paragraph thirty is in the context of customs. Oh yes, I know. And physical, fiscal checks. Those are about fiscal checks. Uh, the the agri food section is, is thirty three onwards. Yes, I'm moving on in terms of I'm moving from Sorry. customs on to uh, agri-food. I just want to know, are all live animals checked presently, leaving, say, going from Larne to Scotland? Um, I'm not sure what happens in that direction. I know there are definitely checks on live animals entering at Larne. Yeah. That's part of the status quo. I, 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 don't, I don't know what... Uh, I'm less familiar with the other direction unless Lorraine or Lindsay have... Anything on that? Okay, that's okay. Um, I think it's probably just at the macro level that um, um, Trevor was talking about. Um, the UK net contribution to the EU presently is in pounds, 11 billion a year. Sorry, I'm asking the at the macro level, the overall yes. UK. Yes. And so during any extension, we would continue to pay at that rate. I think the, my understanding is that is that um, in the in the scenario of an extension, the financial contribution would be negotiable 
uh, I don't think it's it, 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 it's I'm not sure you can extrapolate from membership into what would be a unique scenario of a um, a, a departing member state uh, without uh, which, would, would, which would not be participating in at least some or, or quite a lot of, of the uh, financial instruments that are covered in the in the mainstream Commission uh, or mainstream European financial system. So I I, I wouldn't I think that there would in the in a, in the scenario of extension there there would be a financial contribution, but it wouldn't necessarily be. Um, purely a rule forward of the status quo. Given how flexible it's been, I'm sure the EU would be reasonable with us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, that's a, I think that's above that's my pay rate, my answer that. <laughs> um, In terms of contacts between um, Northern Ireland and Whitehall, and then Whitehall and Brussels, away from the sort of showpiece negotiation sessions. Could you talk to me about that in terms of what's our level of contact, the executive office's level of contact with uh, Whitehall on these issues and if you could give us an insight just into how often the conversations are taking place between Whitehall and Brussels as well. Um, so um, the, the practical fact is that an awful lot of attention in the last few weeks was on getting the um, um, last week's document uh, organized and published. So that's where they, a lot of the energy was. There's a new phase now, and certainly our hope and expectation is that that takes us into a different place where there can be more detailed, um, more, more fulsome engagement. Certainly that's our aspiration, and uh, I hope it comes, comes to pass, uh, because I think that, that's, that's, that's important for, for looking, looking ahead. Uh, we, we've got very good working relationships that people, people we deal with in cabinet office uh, and NIO are uh, you know, that, that, that's a it's a it, it's a good set of relationships. It definitely needs to move forward now into into a much more detailed uh, engagement. Insofar as as there are matters that are are within the devolved or which affect the devolved uh, range of responsibilities. So lots lots to be done there. Lots to pursue, um, but it, it's uh, just as a matter of fact, um, that's the, the, the nature of, of life has been heavily focused on on um, um, last week's document for, for, for in recent weeks. The reason I'm, I'm asking is I just think people. It's important that people don't fall into the trap of believing simply that the the negotiating sessions for, that last for two days in front of the media are the full extent of the contact that's taking place. Uh, we know we all know how these things work. Sherpas work yeah. things out before. Yeah, that's okay. And no, we're absolutely, absolutely right. You know, the, 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 the informal, detailed exchanges are the ones that will will matter, and uh, we have limited access. We, we, we recognise that, but it's still. Very, very important. We do the best we can in those areas, you know. And just to be clear as well, it is only again at the the macro level. It is envisaged by both sides that these arrangements will simply be temporary, and that best endeavours will be used on both sides to arrive at technical solutions. Is that the, is that a correct statement of the position? So, uh, as you say, there is a reference to best endeavours in Article 6 of the protocol. That's, that's clear. Um, the, um, uh, the, the withdrawal agreement itself uh, refers to the potential for it to be uh, superseded um, in whole or in part. Um, so that, that's, those, are, those are, are just words, you know, the words clearly in the agreements I think what, what will matter looking ahead is is uh, how the um, fundamental requirements that, w that govern the negotiations how those are fulfilled looking ahead. Uh, so uh, therefore, you know, the, the um, issue of, of, of what happens in the longer term is is will depend on how things work out in practical terms and, and both the nature of the free trade agreement and on the um, 
um, the way in which implementation takes place. You know, I'm not sure. Maybe Lorraine and Lindsay would want to come in on 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 those those wider perspectives. Hi, Andrea it's Lorraine here. No, it was it was just to add to the point about our engagement with Whitehall and perhaps maybe to elaborate a bit about the role of TEO within that. So we work directly with Cabinet Office, facilitating discussions between NICS departments and counterpart departments, and at which some representatives of CFE might be also in the room. But, I mean, to the extent to which these discussions um, get into those wider political issues of landing zones and, and the negotiations, the, the sessions are good in, in providing additional clarity. Um, on Even now, since we've got the legal text, looking at how we might further those, there is good working level relationships uh, with officials, but it's that extra bit in terms of, um, as Andrew's referred to, the negotiations themselves and the political space that they will be in. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to move to the members on the phone now, and I'm just going to take um, them, go through them in order that I heard them joining the conversation at the start of the meeting. So, um, Pat, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask of the panel? Sometimes the members are listening by watching the video, which gives a slight, yeah. slight delay. I'll just pop on. Yeah. Oh, yes? Sure. Pat, Pat Sheehan here. Yes, Pat. Do you, do you have any questions to ask of the panel? No, I'm, I'm okay. But any points I have have been covered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. George, are you there? Do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, Chair, I'm still here, but um, I, I'm okay at the moment. Yes, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, Emma, are you there? Would you like to ask a question? Hello, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed, yes. No, I just wanted to ask, have we got a, a calculation yet? I know there's been um, some estimations of how much the North is going to lose in terms of funding from the EU. Obviously, your CAP, Rural Development Programme, all of these things. Have, have we got a, a figure yet of, of what, we're, what the net loss is going to be? Lindsay, are you, are you able to help on that, or, or Lorraine? I don't uh, know I, I just, it's, it's part of the answer of one of the questions the committee has asked, so it, it's to go back again, but the figures which are in the public domain as well, uh, and this is just on the structural funds, would be that the European Regional Development Fund is worth three, $313.2 million. Uh, the common agricultural policy, but that's pillar two, so it excludes the basic payment, is 228.4 million euro, and the European Social Fund is 210 million euro, and there obviously would be the cap pillar one on top of that. So um, that information has come back to the, the committee very soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are you happy enough there, Emma, or do you want to ask a supplementary? No, well, I suppose not happy um, with what we're, we're hearing, but no, thanks for that. Okay. Uh, and then finally, Trevor Clark, are you still there? Would you have a question you want yeah. to ask? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Andrew and the team, for their presentation. Um, I would just like to ask if Northern Ireland remains in the EU's customs union after the transition period, um, there's concern, particularly in my own constituency with the Belfast International Airport, and disadvantaged with other passengers uh, from other airlines, IT, or sorry, other airports, access duty-free and tax-free sales uh, coming from other EU routes. Has there been any discussion with the government in relation to uh, the local departments making representation in terms of what Northern Ireland is going to lose out in relation to that? Um, Trevor, I don't have an answer on that one just now, unless my, my colleagues can help on, on that. I know there's been some, some thought. Um, that, but, but yeah, I think in here, just um, on that issue, the customs and excise would be um, an accepted matter, which would sit within UK government responsibility. Uh, but I think it would be fair to say that you know, if there was any change of policy, it would need to have an economic impact assessment, um, uh, you know, to feed into that that decision. But there hasn't been any discussions on that, as far as I'm aware, at the minute. Well, I accept this as a reserve matter, however, given that Northern Ireland has the International Airport um, and it sits outside the mainland of the UK, 
Um, I presume there will be disadvantage here. So is it something then you're flagging up? Are you going to flag up, taking that forward? Um, Go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, no, there's no plans at the minute. I'm, uh, I'm just aware that we have had some correspondence in relation to this, but there's no plans. At Sorry, you have no plans? Or, well, I, I, think, I, think, I think it's one thing we need to look into further, Trevor, and, and come back to you more properly with, with a, a fuller answer. I think, I think there's, uh, there's a... I, as you, you've, you've hit on one of the, um, you know, unique and I'm not sure, not, not sure, may, may not totally foreseen consequences of the unique arrangements whereby we'll be, uh, you know, part of the UK customs territory in law, but have, you know, a range of obligations in relation to the EU as a result of the protocol. So working out precisely how that's applied, how that then impacts on something specific like duty free. I think that that's uh, I think I'd, I'd want to look at that more properly and come back to you with a better answer if, if you don't mind Trevor. Sorry, sorry for ducking it uh, I will right now, but, but I think, I think, I think you've got a fair point a fair point uh, it's an important point, point to probe it's and uh, I, I would I would be astonished if um, um, Belfast International Airport aren't aren't uh, you know pushing that very actively as as you'd expect them to. I, I would expect them to but then I would also expect right, of yourself and your department to push it because uh, Belfast sure. Airport can only push it through political representation. They haven't; they're not at the table to actually make representation directly on their own behalf. And, and it would worry me that it's not considered. And going forward, um, the International Airport has always been disadvantaged with some of the offerings that's going on in Dublin Airport. And given the influence with the the, uh, the Irish government in relation to the airport, they've always been disadvantaged because of that. What I would like to see is that something's going forward here now to make sure that there's a case made for the international, because we need to be um, an equally same footing as other airports on this island. Strong points, uh, and let, let us look into the detail and come back to you. Okay. There is a solution and partition. <laughs> Christopher, you were looking at extra supplementary, I think, on to something that was being asked there. Yes. Um, as part of the fact that we're no longer going to be obliged under certain EU regulations, we now have a greater scope for the development of free ports. And I know that the Chancellor of the Exchequer literally wrote the book on free ports and the benefits of free ports. This is related to our exit from the European Union. I'm just wondering what discussions have there been about the development of free ports. My understanding is the government intended to create 10 of them around the United Kingdom. And has the Executive Office come to a position in terms of A, would we want one for Northern Ireland? Uh, and B, well, I personally, I think it should be in Belfast, but I know other people disagree with me on that. Um, but I just, just if you could talk to that for me. Uh, so that's, I think, that's, I think the issue there is primarily an economic policy issue for uh, for Department of the Economy. Yeah. Uh, we, we have had some uh, brief discussions. Uh, it's not something that I've been involved in personally in any great detail, but I think uh, the, the, there's certainly a view, and as you say, this is something that Chancellor Schneck has been personally very um, active on going back before the time he was he was in, in government uh, or at, at a different, different stage. So yeah, there's a, a lot of a lot of interest uh, in both uh, looking at it from a, from a Belfast point of view and a Northwest point of view. So, uh, but I think the policy analysis and advice as to the value and merits of the idea and the way in which to respond to the um, uh, UK government uh, consultation um, that that's which, uh, which is currently underway. Um, that that needs to be considered further, primarily by by economy. Although I think there probably is an element element that it would, would affect um, other other departments, and therefore it, it, it should become a, a an issue that executive and um, you as a committee might want to consider further. It's a, a very very interesting um, policy development. Well, we not, not our not our special subject, I'm afraid. Sorry. We should ask for two. 
One for the Northwest and one for Belfast, and everybody's happy. Well, I was thinking we were going to go for a counterbalance <laughs> here for Foyle, maybe for, for the port, but Martina? Well, I just want to say that I don't want to, to be associated with anything that's involved in tax evasion or tax avoidance. We've heard enough of that, what that has done across the world, and we know that Freeport has made a contribution uh, to all of that. So I would caution against rushing into embracing that concept. And I think there's much more needs to be done. It doesn't surprise me that a, a British government, a cabinet of millionaires, that one of their people would write a book on that. God forbid you should create opportunity for your constituents. So given that, uh, thankfully, this is not uh, the realms of our committee here and another committee, we can conclude our conversations there. Members, thank you very much, Seth, and thank you to the panel uh, for your, uh, your answers today. Um, Lorraine and Lindsay uh, I appreciate we didn't hear too much from yourselves but thank you for joining us and Andrew thank you for your answers it's a, a very complex issue and we appreciate the, the full answers that you've given us and we thank you for that and no doubt we'll have you back again sometime soon for some more questions so thank you very much indeed Thanks Rosemary okay. Good luck next time Thanks, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you Thank you So um, to the committee then um, just winding up from that um, I'm going to suggest that we um, write to the department and ask for all the relevant information um, that is provided to the committee as soon as possible about the agendas and the um, about the meetings when they're confirmed I think it's actually pretty important that we get sight of those before the meetings happen because it's very difficult for us to influence the decisions and I do feel that in a lot of the information that we're getting regarding uh, Brexit matters we're finding out afterwards when we can absolutely have no influence but can only scrutinise the decisions that are there but uh, we'll certainly uh, I know that in, in the other devolved regions they are getting sight of agendas etc beforehand so it would be good if we might get that and we could certainly write and ask for that and then also um, the command paper as it's referred to and that's in the pack there which refers to the extensive work that the executive ministers will need to do to implement the protocol it might be wise of us to contact and write to the department and ask them if they could give us a list of all the various items that would have to be carried out uh, and what will need to be done and any progress that there is to date so if members are content we could write to the department and ask for that information is everyone content mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well then, uh, members, we can move on then to item five, which is the forward work program. Uh, it's on page eighty-seven of the meeting pack. Um, are you content to note the forward work program and maybe just to, to let you know that the junior ministers have confirmed that they will attend our committee meeting on the twenty-fourth of June to update us again on Brexit issues. Um, so I think it might be reasonable as well to ask that. Uh, any of the future updates that we receive are from the junior ministers, just given the territory that we're moving into. Mm -hmm. Would that be agreeable with the committee? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've got quite a lengthy uh, element for the next part of the agenda, so if I could ask for members... Uh, Chair, sorry, oh. before you move on, can I just come in on the forward work programme? Of course, yes, Pat, go on ahead. Uh, uh, it's just that the shared future funding comes to an end in March uh, 2021. I'm wondering, would it be possible to get a briefing from the department in relation to future plans for that? Okay. Could we, put that could we put that on the forward work program? Reasonable enough. Are members happy and content yeah, for that to be added? Okay, Pat, that's grand. Thank you very much. We'll get that added in and get it scheduled and update members when we uh, hear back from the department as to when it will take place. So hopefully we can get that soon. Sir Justin George here. I, yes, I have to leave now for quite, quite a few constituency issues to sort out here. Okay, George, that's okay. great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, right. Bye. 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 So, members, item six, correspondence. There are ten items of correspondence in the main pack and one that is in the tabled pack. I'll draw your attention to a number of the piece of the items. Um so Item 6.1 at page 92 of the meeting pack is a response from David Sterling on the perceived conflict of interest regarding the HIA interim advocate and the appointment process for the Commissioner of Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse. It is anticipated that the Commissioner will be appointed in late summer. Um, at last week's meeting, the committee agreed to schedule a briefing session with the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse once appointed. Are members happy to note that? Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, item 6.2 on page 94 of the meeting pack is a response from the Executive Office to the committee's request for clarification on whether the department is the subject to any active legal proceedings regarding the appointment of the HIA interim advocate. The Executive Office has confirmed that at present there are no active legal proceedings. This means the committee is now able to deal with related correspondence that was held due to finding that out. So are we content to note? <coughs> okay. Then items 6.3 and 6.4 on pages 95 and 96 of the meeting pack are in relation to the HIA interim advocate and the perceived conflict of interest. Um, could I get agreement to forward the correspondence to the First and Deputy First Minister, asking them to respond directly to the authors and to copy the committee into the responses? Mm-hmm. Could, could I just ask a question? I'm sorry. To, um to flick back to 6.1, um, I, I want to talk about the perceived conflict of interest. Uh, and it said that the two TO officials and the independent social worker did not see a conflict of interest. Uh, and yet David Sterling was only informed of the issue in the autumn of 2019, um, uh, some months afterwards. Is there any way of finding out or writing to David Sterling to find out, did he or would his view have been that there was a conflict of interest? Because at the minute he's, he's just said, look, I didn't know about this issue. I found it some months afterwards. It doesn't say whether or not he believed that was a conflict of interest or not. Because this is a real model. This is a real mess. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the people who are suffering here through real disunity, and, and I can understand why, are the victims. Um, forget about the data breach nonsense. I'm, I'm not talking about that at the minute. But this is, this is the core of the, the problem here, it is that uh, the appointment process... Um, there's a perceived conflict of interest, and David Sterling didn't even know about that. Okay, well, I think asking for that clarification okay. is yep. reasonable, and we can get the response back then. Thank you. Um, so, item 6.5, 6.5 and 6.6 on page oh, 97 uh, yeah. to 99 of the yeah. meeting pack are in relation to the discussions that took place around the perceived conflict of interest at the committee meeting on the 29th of April. Could I propose that the authors are advised that the discussions were intended to establish the circumstances around the perceived conflict of interest and that the committee does not hold a view into the matter? Uh, c- content to note that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Item 6.7 at page 102 of the meeting pack is a response from an individual regarding historical institutional abuse and the appointment of Mr Justice Colton as President of the Redress Board. Members of the committee considered correspondence from the individual at last week's meeting and agreed to forward it to the Office of the Lord Chief Justice, asking that the Lord Chief Justice responds directly to the individual and copies the committee into the response. The individual has expressed disappointment that the detail of the correspondence was not discussed and the only action taken was to refer to the Lord Chief Justice for response. Um, Can I propose to you that the individual is advised that the judiciary is independent of government and in recognising the paramount importance of that independence, the committee does not get involved in such matters? Is there agreement to that? Okay. Okay. Item 11, page 5 in the table pack is a copy of correspondence from an individual to the Executive Office in respect of the recent, recent data breach affecting victims of historical abuse. Now, we know from the Minister's response to yesterday's urgent oral question and the Executive Office has responded to all of the complaints received. Um, can I propose that the individual is sent a copy of the Hansard which details the actions which have been taken forward following the data breach? Now, the data breach must be, as we are all aware, very distressing for the individuals involved and many of whom have sought anonymity throughout the, the previous Heart inquiry, inquiry and the current redress process. Now, victim groups have suggested that a breach of this confidentiality could be life-threatening for more vulnerable victims. And I'm sure, like me, other members were relieved to hear that the Way of Trauma Group has been drafted in very quickly to try and provide extra support that is needed uh, for those that are affected. Now, the issue of the data breach is being dealt with by the Information Commissioner as is due process. But because of the urgency around the matter and the length of time that it might take for an ICO to reach its conclusions, There is also a fact-finding exercise being carried out by the Group Head of Internal Audit in the Department of Finance. The results of that exercise should be available for consideration by Ministers in the next few days. So can I propose that the Committee writes to the Department asking to be kept up to date 
on the findings of that exercise and any other developments. Yeah. And during the Minister's response yesterday, she mentioned that a meeting will take place next week with some of the institutions involved in the historical institutional abuse. This is an area in which the committee has already taken previous uh, and particular interest. So could I propose that the committee asks the department for a written update on the outcome of that meeting with a view to scheduling an oral briefing once more substantial discussions have taken place? Rather than just writing for an update, could we also make it clear, because I think it is the unified position of this committee, that, just to restate, it is the expectation of all members that they will be making a significant financial contribution to any scheme to help the victim. Of course. All of those institutions need to pay. Okay, all agreed. Chair, can I just ask, um, whenever we had the question session um, uh, yesterday, was it yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Oh, was it? Goodness. Um, the, the First Minister said that she would provide a, a, a copy of the, the, the data breach protocols that they, they adhere to. Is there any way we can ask for a copy yes. of those data breach yeah. protocols, yeah. please, and, and any of the um, documentation which links how their GDPR should operate? And that was in relation to one member, but if we could ask it for the yeah, committee. Absolutely, to get yeah, for the committee, so, mm -hmm. so, so okay. we, we get a better understanding of, of what, should have, what should have happened on, on that breach. Sure. Okay, that's good. Okay, is there, uh, any, are members content to note the remaining items of correspondence? Yes. Yep. Okay, so item seven, Chairman's business. I have sorry, no sorry, oh, Chair, sorry, can yep. we go back to, I think it's 6.9. I think it would be important for this committee to have a few on. It was a letter that we received from the um, Economy Committee, and it was asking the Economy Minister to work with the Finance Minister and the two, uh, the, the two joint ministers to ensure that the hardship fund um, also covers sole traders and those recently self-employed. I'm sure I'm not the only MLA sitting around this table who have been contacted yeah. by people who are sole traders and recently self-employed. So I want to completely concur and support uh, this, lead, this, this letter from, from the chair of the committee because I think it is absolutely essential that that hardship fund deals with those recently self-employed as well as the sole traders. And when you look at the separate schemes that have been run by the Department of the Economy uh, and those uh, available through, through the British Treasury, you can see that again and again uh, that all of the schemes that the, those recently self-employed are left out. And there are cases, as I say, that I've been dealing with. I know other MLAs have told me that they are doing the same. I'm dealing with people in Derry. Uh, who are recently only self-employed or for some of them who are sole traders and they're coming under significant financial pressure and undoubtedly I think this, this sort of negatively affects people's mental as well as their physical health. So and without the support we know that even those who have been able to ac access some of the schemes are saying that they will struggle to, uh, to maintain their business uh, in the time ahead. But those that haven't had access, they're saying that they are going to go right under uh, right away. So I would urge the, the, the ministers to work together collectively, the, the economy minister to go to the finance minister to work, work with the, uh, the two uh, first ministers to try and ensure that this hardship, the hardship scheme uh, can be accessed by those who have been recently, and it's the recent self-employed, as well as the sole traders who are falling off the table and aren't being dealt with in any of these schemes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are you happy enough for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other items for correspondence that people wish to note? Okay. Then we can move to item seven, which is chairman's business. I have none for us today. Uh, item eight. Any other business? The committee um, was told at the start of March that a program for government for the year twenty. 2020 2021 uh, would be ready for april 2020 obviously with coronavirus it's undoubtedly had an impact but maybe we should be um uh, writing to get an update on the program for government process and progress would members be happy if we send off correspondence for that i think um, we should contextualize it in the understanding oh, yeah. of coronavirus and Absolutely. all of the departments Absolutely. we're dealing with um any other business then okay Folks, then, uh, date, time, and place of next meeting. We will be meeting Wednesday, the 3rd of June, next Wednesday at 2 o'clock in this room. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed for participation today. Thank you.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.